good morning. morning. It's great to see you all. Um, Why don't we pray before we open up God's Word together? Our Father, we come to you through Jesus' name and in the Spirit, and we acknowledge our dependence on you here, and uh, we all in this room lack in so many ways and not only just have perceived needs, but we lack the ability to reflect your character in the fullness that it deserves and it ought to be displayed. And so we pray that you'd make us a people here who embrace truth and love and who have convictions and clarity of thought from your word and also hearts filled with compassion for others. We pray that you do your work in your word this morning to cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, this morning we are uh, continuing our sermon series in the book of Leviticus. So if you'd join me in opening your Bibles to Leviticus 18. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, what we do in this time is we're usually just working through a book of the Bible, section by section, so we come to Leviticus 18 this morning, and so you can grab a Bible from under the seats nearby you, so I invite you to do that because we'll spend the next uh, 40 or so minutes uh, just working through a chapter in the Bible, and uh, Leviticus 18 is on page 96 in those Bibles, and if you don't own a Bible, please take that. We would love for you to have it so you can explore more about who Jesus is. Well, we are living in the wake of a sexual revolution, and I'm not referring to the sexual revolution that started in the 60s, it had seeds certainly long before, I'm referring to a sexual revolution that occurred in the first centuries. In the first century Roman world, sexuality was viewed as merely a physical appetite, and it favored the powerful. So men could sleep with whoever they wanted as long as they were of a lower class and honor, and that applied to married men as well. Uh, Married women, though, could only have sex with their husbands. And the early Christian movement was revolutionary in that culture. One of the distinctives of the early Christian movement was its vision of sexuality. And this is part of what made Christianity attractive in the Roman Empire, because it said that sex is not merely an appetite, it's a divine gift, it's a gift from God, and it's good, and it has cosmic significance. God is a God of love, history is a story of love, marriage pictures the love of God for His people. And sex is a gift for marriage to express and strengthen that bond of committed, covenantal, consensual love. So this was radical, it was dignified, it was a cosmically significant vision of sexuality. It was certainly offensive to some, especially elites, but it was attractive to many. It equalized classes, it honored women. And it slowly won the culture, and it's influenced the world ever since. But now, a couple thousand years later, we're experiencing a second sexual revolution. It's been going on for the past 60 or so years in force, and the core of this is the belief that sexuality is fundamentally about self-expression. So this revolution is, in many ways, a reversal and transformation of that first sexual revolution in the first centuries. And so many people, including Christians, are starting to ask, has the second, several, uh, second sexual revolution gotten it right? Should we rethink things? Is it time to change our vision of gender and sexuality and marriage? And certainly plenty of professing Christians and leaders and authors and parents are slowly shifting away from this Christian vision. And so this means that Christians who hold fast to Jesus are back in the position of the Christians in the first century. They're once again called to live a countercultural sexual ethic. 
So this morning, we're going to look at a text that preceded both of these revolutions. It's Leviticus 18. This is God's instructions to Israel at the beginning of their history as a nation. So they found themselves in a similar kind of situation that the early Christians did in the first century and that Western Christians do in the Western world now. The nations around them were filled with various sexual practices, and God called Israel to a sexual ethic that was countercultural. And this vision of sexuality that God gave Israel is consistent with His vision for us today. So God has an unchanging vision for human sexuality. It's consistent from Genesis to Revelation, from Genesis to Leviticus to Jesus, and to us today. So before we look at this text, I want to address a few challenges that we have with a text like Leviticus 18 that addresses this in the Old Testament. First of all, I just want to Make it clear, we're not addressing this text at random today, though that would be okay. We're moving through Leviticus, and so this is the chapter that we come to. Our pattern is to preach through books of the Bible and to take everything that comes in those books, to not skip and pick and choose, and so here we are. Uh, We come to Leviticus 18, addressing topics as they're relevant to culture as they come. Second, we need to be careful to not arbitrarily apply Old Testament laws to New Testament Christians. This is situated in the Old Covenant for Israel. So Jesus has now brought the New Covenant, and so we're not under the laws of Leviticus as Israel was. They're fulfilled in Christ, but they're still God's Word for us today, and they express His vision for sexuality. And so as we'll see, the moral vision for sexuality here is consistent through the Bible. So Jesus didn't come to remove these expectations, but to enable us to fulfill them. Third, Uh, Many people have referred to this text, along with about five or six others in the Bible, as a clobber passage. Maybe you've heard that term before. So some view the biblical texts that address homosexuality directly, for instance, as clobber passages because they're they're viewed as texts that Christians have used to clobber people. Uh, And many Christians have been incredibly unkind in the way that they have addressed this topic. So that, that kind of feeling isn't completely unwarranted. Some of you approach this kind of sermon with trepidation. You're thinking like, what is Drew going to say? Um, You may be thinking, is he going to single someone out? Is he going to embarrass all of us? So I want to be clear about how we approach this text. We approach it with a commitment to both truth and love as we do addressing any and every topic. We want to embrace whatever God's Word says as true, and we want to have hearts filled with love. We we reject our current culture's uh, sense that you, if you disagree with someone, you must disdain them. I mean, we just reject that. It's not true. You can disagree with people and be friends with them and love them and welcome them into your life. And so we acknowledge that together. So the Bible's teaching doesn't single anyone out. It confronts all of us. Everyone needs to adjust to Jesus. All of us need to adjust to Jesus in regard to the topic of sexuality, not just a few of us. So we're exploring this chapter today, and we'll read the text as we go, but here's the point of the text up front. God calls His people to a countercultural sexual ethic for their flourishing. God's vision of sexuality is for our good. Jesus has come both to forgive us for our failings and to empower us to live a life that reflects both truth and beauty. So this is for our good. So we'll walk through the three main sections of this text, and those three sections answer three big questions about this countercultural sexual ethic. Why does it matter? What is it? And how is this relevant today? So first, why does it matter? Well, this chapter doesn't jump right into commands. God doesn't just drop commands from the sky to us. He gives rationale. He always gives rationale. And so we see this in the first five verses. You can read it with me. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I'm bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. 
You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. So Israel just came out of Egypt. They're headed toward the land of Canaan. And God says that they're to be different from both of those cultures. And the emphasis of this chapter, as we'll see, is on their sexual ethic. So in Egypt, it's helpful to know, as we're going to read in this text, incest was common among royalty. And in Canaan, where they're going, they were known, they had a reputation for homosexuality and bestiality. God is giving Israel a different vision. So two, or the broad point is this, don't base your sexual ethic on cultural consensus around you, right? Even a culture's laws can be unethical. Just because something is legal doesn't make it right. So, so our culture, any culture, their consensus or their laws, that's an unstable foundation for sexual ethics. So God gives two reasons why he's calling them to embrace this vision, why this countercultural ethic matters. The first reason is this, because of who he is. Do you see the repeated phrase? The very first thing God says in verse 2, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. He repeats it at the end of verse 4, I am the Lord your God. Again at verse 5, I am the Lord. He'll introduce the next section in verse 6 with I am the Lord. He'll say it again midway through, and he says it again in the last verse, and it's repeated Uh, well over a dozen times more in the next chapter and then after that. So, the very first thing God says is not how they must live, but who He is. So, when you see the word Lord here in your translations with small caps, it's translating the name of God, which is Yahweh. So, this is the name He referred to Israel when He rescued them from Egypt. It carries the sense of, I am with you and for you. Uh, There's various reasons through history, don't need to get into it now, why modern translations pick this word Lord, which um, is probably not the best, it's not a translation of that word, it's kind of a substitute. Um, But this is the sense of God's personal name, and and it, it refers to and it carries a sense of, I am with you, I am for you. It's the name He revealed when He brought them out of Exodus. So before He gives the content of His ethics for them, He reminds them of who He is. He's the Creator. So he's their king. He made the world. He's their authority. They must listen to him. But he's also their redeemer who loves them and commands them for their good. And he's saying to them, look to me for your ethics. So this is already countercultural. Where does our culture say to get its sexual ethic? Typically one of two places. It either says look inside or look around, right? Look inside at your feelings. What do you want? What do you feel? What do you desire? Then that is what is good and right, and the best thing for you is to live that out. Or it says your culture is supreme. So get your intuitions from there. Don't you see where the, the history is headed? Don't you want to be on the right side of history? Your culture is moving somewhere. It's obvious, isn't it? But both of those sources can change, and they do change, and therefore they're unstable. God is saying, don't look inside at your feelings for this. Don't look around at the culture for this. Look at me. I'm the one who made you and loves you and designed you. I I made up sex for your good. Look to me to explain how life should work for flourishing so we can trust Him. So the first reason why this matters is because of who God is. The second reason is because of His promise for flourishing. He gives guidance on our sexuality for our good and for our flourishing. This is in verse 5, which says, You shall therefore keep my commandments and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. And this probably refers to Israel living in the land a long and fruitful life. The end of the chapter comes back to this and gives the opposite side of this. If they reject this, they'll be sent out of the land. They won't have a long life in the land. So, this connects to the bigger, bigger purpose of Leviticus, which is to guide Israel to transformed flourishing with God, to life as it was meant to be lived. So, God made the world. He designed sexuality as a good gift, and He's calling His people to embrace His design for their good, for their life in the land. So, that's why this matters. So, what's the content then of this ethic? 
The second part of this chapter answers the second question then this morning, which is what is it? What is the ethic? And it's given in verses 6 through 23. Now, this is not a comprehensive list. This is actually not even just a positive vision for sexuality. It's a contrast list. So, Israel's heading toward the land of Canaan. They've just come out of a certain culture. They're heading into another one. And so, God's drawing attention to the things that the nations do that are out of step with His vision and saying, don't do those things. So, the agenda of this chapter is set in part by what the cultures around them were doing, and there's six practices that Israel is to avoid. First, they're not to marry close relatives. Verse 6 is kind of the intro to a longer section about that. It says, none of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. Now, that's a euphemism for sexual relations in marriage. And then verses 7 through 18 list all the various relationships that are included. And rather than reading the list, and it's not even comprehensive, this is what uh, scholars would call common law. So, there's examples given, and they're meant to be applied to similar situations. So, this, this isn't even comprehensive, but here's a summary. It lists father, mother, sister, granddaughter, sister-in-law, aunt, uncle, daughter-in-law, sister-in-law. They also can't take a wife's sister as a rival wife. So, these are the relationships that were part of a household or extended family. And this is probably not exhaustive. It's also all addressed to men, but that doesn't mean it doesn't apply to women. It would have been assumed to apply broadly. So, one thing that's often overlooked is how a list like this, uh, because we come to this with so many of our questions in mind, we can miss how this kind of list is meant to protect the vulnerable. This prevents men from forcing themselves into relationships with family members. It's giving legal warrant to resist the abuse of power. So, God's people should be passionate, as God is, about protecting against abuse. And so, we as a church want to protect and advocate for victims of abuse, and in this context, sexual abuse. The second prohibition is about not violating God's purity laws regarding sexual relations. So, verse 19 prohibits a husband from having relations with his wife during her time of month. And this, the point is not that the act itself is sinful. It was brought up earlier with the kind of clean and unclean purity laws earlier in Leviticus, and it wasn't viewed as a sin there. It's part of the symbol-laden ritual purity regulations of Israel, which were time-bound for them. But it's, so it's connected to those, and God is saying in this context to blatantly violate that in the bedroom is wrong and is sinful. So, you, you cannot blatantly violate, as an Israelite, these purification laws related to sexuality. The third prohibition is for adultery, verse 20, and you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife, and so make yourself unclean with her. The fourth is against child sacrifice, verse 21, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. So, this is connected to sexuality because children are the fruit of those actions. So, this is about caring for children. The Canaanites and others around would sacrifice their children to an idol, a false god that they called Moloch. There's archaeological evidence of children being burned as offerings uh, to Moloch in the, in the valleys. And we hear about that in recoil. But the same dynamic is at work today. It's just more sanitized. One of the idols in our culture isn't Moloch, but ambition and individual success. Ancient people sacrificed children to Moloch. Our culture sacrifices children to ambition. Children inside and outside the womb are human beings worthy of protection. So, our culture values caring for the vulnerable, and it's because of the influence of Christianity uh, but it's never consistently applied that ethic. It first denied this human right to slaves, and now it denies that human right to the unborn. The issue of abortion is the greatest social injustice of our time. So, this is the context here. Christians are to advocate for the unborn. We advocate for adoption. We advocate for caring for mothers and fathers. 
in need. Fifth prohibition is homosexual activity. Verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. So this prohibits homosexual activity. But we should be clear that this isn't addressing attractions. So it's true that even though our desires are fallen and misdirected often and tainted with sin, that's true. And so same-sex attraction is here as part of the fallen world. So some of you may struggle with same-sex attraction, and we want you to know that you can live a life faithful to God, and you are welcome here in our church. You can resist that temptation and not pursue those behaviors. We are all living with broken and disordered desires as Christians learning to follow Jesus faithfully. And so every one of us has to hear this message. It's not just those with same-sex attractions that have to deny themselves to follow Jesus. We all do. God calls all of us to reserve all of our sexual activity for the context of a marriage between a man and a woman. So all of us may struggle with misdirected desires. Many struggle with lust. Many married men and women struggle with attractions to other men or women who aren't their spouse. Many struggle with temptation, but we're together seeking to follow Christ who calls us to self-denial. So we want to be a church that just is honest and open with who we are and also honest and open with the truth of what it means to follow Jesus. So now we come to the last prohibition, verse 23. And you shall not lie with any animal and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Now, we may think that we don't have to say this today. I almost get the sense that, you know, we come to a text like this, and at some level, we're kind of like, oh, no, what's, what's God going to say here, and are we embarrassed by this chapter? You, I get the sense, kind of spending time in this this week, that you almost sense God is saying, do I really have to say these things? Um, but we do. Just this past week, the esteemed in many circles ethicist Peter Singer was pushing this. Uh, an article was tired, zoophilia is morally permissible. And here's what Singer said, this piece challenges one of society's strongest taboos and argues for the moral permissibility of some forms of sexual contact between humans and animals. This article offers a controversial perspective that calls for serious and open discussion on animal ethics and sex ethics. So those are the six areas that are countercultural. I mentioned at the start of this list that this isn't comprehensive. It's not a comprehensive vision. These aren't the things that if those cultural things weren't going around, if God was, you know, to pause in Israel for Israel and say, here's the positive vision, this isn't what he would say. Um, he's doing this as a contrast to the surrounding culture. So what would God say if he was given just a context to say, here's the positive vision for sexuality? Well, we don't have to guess. That's why it's helpful to step back here and consider this. Um, because all of this that we've seen in Leviticus 18 is coming out of the convictions and principles from a positive vision. So every sermon in Leviticus, we've seen that there is one crucial and critical background to understanding the book of Leviticus. What is it? Eden, Genesis 1 and 2, the creation story. Leviticus is all about restoring the life that we lost in Eden. And so here, God is calling Israel to embody the ethic of Eden. That's the assumed background here, and it assumes an Edenic ethical ideal. Israel would have received Genesis 1 and 2 as their positive vision, and then now as they're coming out of Egypt and going into Canaan, God is applying that positive vision to the cultural practices that they're going to be tempted to engage in, and He's calling out these six issues. But these six issues are not the positive vision. The positive vision is Genesis 1 and 2. So I just want to highlight a couple things from Genesis 1 and 2 that stand behind all of this. Genesis 1 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then in Genesis 2, God, God brought the man and woman together in marriage. And he's commissioned them in chapter 1 to be fruitful and to multiply and fill the world with the children that they will raise. So one of the key features of that vision in Genesis 1 and 2 
is, uh, for sexual in, um, ethics is integrity. Meaning, there is an integrity to the way that God created us. Gender, marriage, sex, our bodies, parenting, procreation, all of those belong together. There's an integrity to the way that God's made this. They're integrated, in other words. So in our culture, so this is one of the most distinctive differences of God's Edenic ideal and our culture's ideal right now. In our culture, all of those are isolated from one another and disconnected from one another. This is part of the disconnect between when Christians talk to other people who don't understand the Christian ethic or even Christians who don't know the Christian ethic clearly. Um, Christians will not be co uh, comprehensible to other people. You will not be comprehensible to people unless you explain this vision, I'm convinced, of this integrated whole. So, for example, gender is a gift we receive, and it's binary. God created humanity as male and female, Genesis 1. But gender is embodied. It's connected to our bodies. Our bodies are good. It's related to our biology. And gender and biology are both related to marriage. Marriage is between one man and one woman. And all of that is integrally related to sex. Sex is between a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage. That's what sex, sexual expression is for. And all of that is related to procreation. Sex is certainly intended for pleasure, but it's also oriented toward procreation. Of course, in a fallen world, that's not always going to happen, nor is it, is it the only reason for marriage and sex, but it's oriented toward procreation, and that is altogether connected to parenting, because marriage is to be a permanent union partly for the protection and provision of any children that are produced through the sexual union of this male and female together. So, do you see that this is a, an integrated, holistic positive vision. I'm not saying that explaining that way all of a sudden makes it beautiful to our culture, um, but that's the vision. It's a unified vision, and it's a gift from God, and it's for our flourishing. The prohibitions of Leviticus 18 are all addressing things that go against that vision. That's why they're there. That's why they make sense. That's how they make sense. So, in our culture, this is one of the key differences is on this point. Our culture uh, not only disconnects these things, but really at its core is consumeristic, which should be no surprise. I mean, consumerism is kind of a common feature of our culture, but it's also applied to how we understand all of these topics in our sexuality. And so we have applied that to sexuality. So our starting point is the individual and that individual's self-expression, the expression of their feelings and desires. And the individual can then determine how they want to engage with any of these topics and features. And all of them are disconnected, and modern technology has allowed it to be disconnected in many ways. And so they're there to choose. So gender is no longer connected to biology. It can be determined by our feelings. And modern technology can seek to try to adjust, uh, at least at a surface level, biology and hormonal changes. Gender then is also not connected to marriage. People can marry of the opposite gender or the same gender. Sex is no longer connected to marriage either. It's for any relationship or even if there isn't really a relationship. And procreation is disconnected from sex. If two people have sex and it produces a child, they don't necessarily feel committed to raising that child or seeing it through, through parenting. And they're not even committed to keeping it alive. So this is one of the key differences in seeing this just helps us understand one another, helps us understand what's going on. So we don't have to talk past each other. We can at least just explain these two visions, see if that's what we're all both seeing in a conversation where we disagree, and just talk through it as reasonable, uh, kind, humble people. So seeing this helps understand the logic and the integrity of God's creational ideal, and it helps us understand then what's Leviticus 18 doing here? It's reflecting that creational ideal in the context of cultures that have gone off of this. So that's the countercultural sexual ethic. Last, the last section addresses the third question, how is this relevant? 
This section is an exhortation to Israel. God said these things that the nations in Canaan did is leading to their judgment. It's a vivid imagery. Look at verse 24. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. For by all these, all these things from verse 6 through 23, by all these, the nations I'm driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean so that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants. And then God gives an Israel a warning then about this. These are the things those nations did, and he's driving them out. So here's a warning for Israel, verse 26 through 30. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations so that the land became unclean. Lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the person who does them shall be cut off from among their people. So, conclusion, keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you and never to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. So God is saying, this is how the nations in Canaan lived, and it's why I'm driving them out of the land. And now I'm putting you in the land, and if you do the same things, I will drive you out of the land. Israel does not have special privileges to the land merely because they're the ethnic people of Israel. God will remove them just like he removed other nations. And notice the universal applicability of this ethic. Now, not everything in Leviticus has this kind of universal applicability. God's given, we've seen so much here that was unique for Israel in their covenant, and it's super important that Christians understand that we don't just take everything in Leviticus and apply it one-to-one to to Christians today. We've got to look at each text in its context, especially in light of how the new covenant brings these things to fulfillment, where they fit in the storyline of the Bible. But notice in this text the, the universal language of applicability. The text itself shows that this ethic applies more broadly than just to ethnic Israelites. It applies to all the peoples who are with them, strangers and sojourners. And the whole problem God's addressing is the way that Egypt and the Canaanites were living. All those things are moral behaviors that God judged those nations for. So these prohibitions given to Israel are generally applicable to the other nations as well. They're an expression of sin in general. And this is universal, universally applicable because it's rooted in the creational ideal. It's rooted in the Edenic, Edenic ideal for gender and marriage and sexuality. Jesus himself in Matthew 19 reaffirmed this creational ideal in the New Testament for his people, for this vision for gender, marriage, and sexuality norms. So what did happen to Israel? Well, they entered the land, but they did not hold up this ethic. After centuries of rejecting God's ideal, God did send them out of the land. The text would use the language of vomiting them out of the land in exile. And then Jesus came, and Jesus brought a new covenant for his people. And that covenant brings the old covenant to its fulfillment, and Leviticus to its fulfillment. So here's how we can summarize history in like 20 seconds related to this topic. God gave the creational ideal in Genesis 1 to 2, but humanity, all of us, have sinned, and we now no longer conform to this vision. Our desires are broken. We want things we shouldn't want. We act out in ways we shouldn't act. We create cultures that normalize and even celebrate things that are not fitting the ideal. So then God declared, clarified in Leviticus 18, how that creational ideal is going to be countercultural because it's in the midst of a fallen world with fallen cultures. But even Israel failed to keep that and therefore became just like all the other cultures. So Jesus came to do two things, to bring forgiveness for our failures and a welcome to sinners, a welcome, a wholehearted welcome to sexual sinners who humble themselves and repent and receive his forgiveness. And the second thing he brought is the Holy Spirit to be poured out into our hearts, to give us new hearts, 
to be able to begin to live out this ethical ideal. That is what transformed the Roman world in the first century. That's what created the first sexual revolution in human history on the planet. It transformed the world. So now fast forward a couple thousand years and we're living in the midst of a second sexual revolution. And so this is still very relevant to us today. So how do we respond to all of this? Here's five words, and I'll give you my once a year alliteration. We respond with clarity, confession, compassion, community, and Christ. So first, clarity. We have to make sure that if you're following Jesus, if you're a Christian, you've got to be clear about Jesus's sexual ethic for his people. This is why we've considered this text in light of God's creational vision today and fulfilled in Jesus. One of the greatest needs for Christians is to see God's wisdom in this integrated vision. And we need to recover this today because in our culture, we've kind of taken some of this for granted. Our culture, in the, there's been no time in our culture where this has been perfectly done. We're not like, this is not a call to rewind to the 50s. Um, there's, there was brokenness and, and a mess in our culture before that. This is about God's creational ethic and ideal fulfilled in Jesus to transform us. But our culture has been so influenced by the Jesus revolution in Western culture that we have taken a lot of these things for granted, but we didn't think through it. We didn't really have to think through it. We're just kind of living in these because it just seemed like it just fit our cultural sensibilities. Our intuitions as a culture were shaped by these things. Now there's different sensibilities and intuitions. And so we have to recover these things, but actually think about it. Why is it that God made male and female? How does that relate to the body and marriage and sex and procreation and parenting? Let's think through how they actually integrate together for the sake of flourishing and the protection and provision of vulnerable children. And so we ought to get clear. And in light of this, just pay attention also to studies that are coming out on topics related to this. Studies continue to show that our culture's vision is not actually working. Studies show that couples that live together before marriage have less of a success rate. They show that adultery and divorce have massive consequences for children, even adult children. They show that casual sex culture is leading to all sorts of abuses and objectification of women. They show that the addiction to images online hollows people out. And under all this is our culture's value of the individual at the center of all things. We put the individual at the center of life and feelings at the center of the individual and sexuality at the center of feelings. And, and that becomes the core of our identity. Who are you? Well, I'm an individual with feelings, and my sexual feelings are the most important thing about me. And then how I relate to the world with these disconnected topics of gender and the body and marriage and sex and procreation and parenting is now how I pursue happiness. We are consumers. How can we use these things as objects to find personal fulfillment and satisfaction when the way that God made us is to put Him at the center and to cause us to flourish in community, thinking through how, how the way we live affects other people around us and how we have both communal and individual flourishing as we embrace and live out this integrated vision and how as sinners we have a welcome toward one another who fail at this, receiving Jesus' grace and forgiveness all through this. And parents, your kids are growing up in a culture that is very confused about all of this and so they need you to be a safe place to talk about this stuff. Uh, I don't know, I'm not going to say an age when it's, you know, time to start talking about this with kids. You know your kids, but chances are if your kids are already a few years old and you haven't started talking about these things, they're hearing about it already. I mean, my boys were talking about last night, we were talking about these things and they were talking about Sesame Street and um, uh, some other kids movie and just talking about it. I mean, it's there um, creating these sensibilities. So talk about these things. And we want to be our church, we want our church to be a safe place to wrestle together as sinners along the path of following Jesus. And if you don't have answers to questions, be honest about that and talk with one another and seek resources that help. So first clarity, uh, briefly for the others here, confession. We've all fallen short of God's Edenic ideal. The biblical doctrine of sin means that every part of us is tainted, even our sexual desires, so we don't just embrace the truth 
which could lead to spiritual pride and superiority, we confess sin in light of the truth. We confess where we failed. So this is not just a countercultural ethic. This is a counter every one of us ethic. Do you feel that? We have all have impulses and lusts in our hearts that are out of sync with God's ideal. And so the church is filled with many people who have a past and who have present temptations. I love 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, where Paul says to the Corinthian Christians, part of this revolution that's taking over the world at the time, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And then he, he lists things that are out of sync with God's ideal. Near, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So that's quite a list, and it includes the sexual issues of Leviticus 18. But what does he say next? Listen to this. Talking to Christians sitting in a gathering like this, and such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified, declared righteous, happily and wholeheartedly by God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So Christians are gatherings of people who know what it's like to live this way. Such were some of you. And we also know what it's like to be washed, to be forgiven, to be justified. What kind of tone does that create in a church? We hold the truth and we extend all sorts of love to one another. So the church at Corinth was filled with people who used to live sexually broken lives, but they're under grace now. And so we confess our sin and seek forgiveness. Third, compassion. The people in our culture or people who disagree with you are not there to despise and disdain, but to love. They're all sinners like us. And while there are certain people who are leading this second sexual revolution of our day that should be opposed, there are many people just caught up in this. They're, and they're seeing that it's not working for them. And they need Christians to welcome them. They, they need churches to be places of help and hope for the refugees of the sexual revolution. Many of us are here as refugees of this revolution. This leads forth to community. Our culture is hyper-individualistic and hyper-sexualized, and it's not working. People are lonely, people are isolated, anxiety and depression rates are skyrocketing because we've made these issues the core of our identity. They need a community that sees their identity as more than their sexuality. A church can be a place of grace and belonging and the welcome of Jesus. And so finally, Christ, he died for us, he rose again, he poured out his spirit to wash us through regeneration and to transform us and he's coming back. If he is this for us, and he loves us like this, we can trust him. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we pray that you would help us here. We've all heard your word and are needing to acknowledge, and many of us are very much feeling this, that we are broken deep inside. We've sinned against you. We don't even understand ourselves sometimes. We're part of a culture that has led to all sorts of intuitions that we have that don't align with you and your better, more beautiful ways. And so we pray for your help. We pray that you would forgive us for our sins. We pray that you give us hope and help through unmet longings, confusion about desires. We pray that you would give us the ability to extend forgiveness to those who have wronged us and sinned against us when they were brought to repentance. And we pray that you'd help our church to continue to be a community of light that holds truth and love together and therefore reflects your character. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.